For many avid video game fans, those who just can't get enough of grinding away for hours on quests, battling endless enemies, and exploring infinite virtual worlds, landing a job as a gameplay tester seems like the perfect opportunity. Doing your favorite thing in the world and getting paid to do it? Well, that's the dream. Plus the added benefit of seeing how the sausage gets made, of getting access to a game still in development, and suggesting ways it can be improved. Think of all the gaming disasters that might have been avoided with a few more playtesters in the room. Looking at you, Fallout New Vegas, and your NPCs with the spinning heads. Ugh. Well, one gamer had the same thought. A young man by the name of Danny Wheeler. When he spotted an ad seeking beta playtesters for an in-development RPG from an up-and-coming indie game studio, he jumped at the chance to apply. The pay wasn't amazing, but it was definitely a better gig than his current job at the local convenience store, hawking energy drinks to snarky teens and counting down the hours until he could get back home, kick up his feet, and get away from it all with a controller in his hand. But sometimes things that seem too good to be true actually are. At first, Danny had a perfectly enjoyable time testing the game. It was standard RPG fantasy fodder, and though he made sure to inform the developers that he found the steampunk aesthetic to be a little bit played out at this point, there was nothing at all notable about it. It was fine. But the development team kept going on and on about the tactical heuristic algorithms, and how the game was meant to learn the more the player played. So Danny was instructed to log as many hours of this exceedingly average game as possible. He sat at his desk for hours, sipping on an extra-large soda and clicking away, fighting orcs, goblins, and more. Slowly, the difficulty began to increase, and the game started to grow on him a bit. He even developed a favorite character to play as, the Rogue, with his stealth and proficiency for close-range combat. The more he played as the Rogue, however, the more he started to notice the game's characters behaving differently. Enemies were attacking him with ranged weapons from far away. They were setting traps to ruin his character's stealthy approach and catch him in the act. Then, the game started to glitch. A lot. To the point of becoming nearly unplayable. Enemies would fall to the ground as if dead when he hadn't dealt them a single blow. As he started to walk his characters away from them, they would suddenly spring back to life and strike before he could even think about a defense. If he didn't know any better, he could swear the game's characters were deliberately trying to trick him. It only got more frustrating from there, with enemies making sudden loud sounds to catch him off guard and startle him out of concentration, and other characters staring down the barrel of the camera with serious, unblinking eyes, as if they could see him through his monitor. One day he fired up the game to see that its characters somehow had rearranged various torches to spell out, You'll never amount to anything, Danny. Your dad was right. It took a ton of torches, and Danny couldn't help but take it personally. That was the last straw. He returned the game to the studio and resigned from his position. He got enough insults working in customer service. He didn't need to take that kind of talk from a video game, though he didn't know it. Danny got out not a moment too soon. Other playtesters were not as lucky, particularly one man who would sadly lose his life. As Danny intuited, this was no ordinary video game. It was unusual enough to draw the attention of the SCP Foundation, who would go on to designate it SCP-1633. SCP-1633 is an anomalous computer game created by a now-defunct independent game studio. The copy currently being held by the Foundation is believed to be a beta version of the game. While the core gameplay is relatively complete, there are numerous missing assets, the music is largely either missing or placeholder music, and the game is plagued by a large number of graphical glitches. Because of the generally buggy and glitchy nature of the game, the Foundation considered both Todd Howard and CD Projekt Red to be major people and groups of interest in the case. However, the discovery of other key suspects eventually absolved them of suspicion. For now. This version of the game was compiled two days before the Foundation raided the office of the studio, and is therefore believed to be the most complete version of the game in existence. To be more specific about the actual nature of the game itself, SCP-1633 is a squad-based RPG with a third-person camera perspective. The action is seen from an elevated perspective, with all characters on screen. Aesthetically, the game world is steampunk, and features various fantasy creatures as enemies, including elves, dwarves, orcs, goblins, etc. Fitting with the steampunk style, the game's urban areas are modeled after Victorian-era London. 
The four player characters are a band of outlaws hired by the sinister Archduke of Bodric to investigate a theft. However, as the game progresses, it becomes a battle to save the entire world, as an ancient, all powerful being known as Krathnar intends to wake from its thousand year slumber and destroy humanity. The player controls a squad of four characters, with direct control over one character at a time and a command menu to control the other three. It is believed that in the game's finished state, a multiplayer option that would have allowed four different real-world players to cooperate is likely to have been included. Like many squad-based games, each character has a different specialty. The marksman uses long-range weapons. The alchemist has access to potions and chemicals with various effects. The rogue can move stealthily and assassinate enemies. And the thug has greater health than the other characters and does more melee damage. And as is also typical for games of this variety, XP earned from completing challenges and killing enemies throughout the game allows for players to upgrade the abilities and stats of their characters. While the story and core gameplay mechanics are nothing special, there is one element that pushes SCP-1633 into anomalous territory, and it's also the element that would have been front and center in a Finnish game's marketing campaign. It's quote, tactical heuristic algorithms. These work in a unique fashion. Whenever a player finishes a session and saves their game, the game will begin running lengthy background processes. When these processes are complete, a PTD, or Player Tactical Data File, is saved on the computer. When the save file and by extension the associated PTD file is loaded, the enemies and challenges in the game will have become far more effective, tailoring their methods to the particular skills and tactics of the player. The extent to which this happened is proportional to the amount of time spent playing the game. This kind of technology may seem theoretically possible, but the extent to which the game pushes it causes it to rest in anomalous territory. The game's programming is so intelligent that it can tell simply by the tiniest clues in your playstyle if you're loading a file that isn't your own. It will then pause the game and make you load your own save file. And the tactics employed by the enemies in the game as they learn more about the player are nothing short of frightening. At first, the enemies will adapt to the player's preferred weapons, strategies, and overall playstyle. Then they will realize that the player character is controlled by an external force, meaning, of course, you, and begin to mount psychological attacks directly on the player. Through numerous tests, the Foundation has been able to build a kind of framework for the average player experience. Through this framework, we're able to track and correlate average playtime with the average adaptability of SCP-1633 to the player. It is worth noting that these effects do not apply if the game is completed in a single continuous playthrough. For the purposes of this experiment, the game was stopped, saved, and restarted at regular intervals, allowing the game to collect player tactical data. During the first two hours, the game's AI is abysmal with enemies simply charging at the players with no strategy whatsoever and typically being mowed down. However, from two to five hours, the enemies undergo intelligence growth, adapting their playstyle to the types of weapons they carry and their environments. At this stage, this combat level is also about equal to an untrained human civilian. From five to eight hours, enemies become considerably more proficient and then begin countering the player on their specific playstyles and techniques. For example, they will attack a player who uses long-range weaponry from cover with grenades or splash damage weapons to force them out into the open. They will also fully utilize their environment for both defensive and offensive purposes, laying traps and creating ambushes to surprise and kill players. At this point, their combat skills are equal to trained soldiers. From 8 to 12 hours, the focus of the enemy shifts from attacking the player character to attacking the player directly. They engage in behaviors that, from an online playing perspective, would be considered griefing, such as intentionally blocking the player's view or movement within the game. Enemies have also been known to exploit player expectations, pretending to be broken or glitched to make the player let their guard down, and then killing them. In one play session, the enemies begin throwing day flash spells, similar to real-life flashbang grenades, at the player. They throw them in a manner that created a strobing effect, causing the player to have a grand mal seizure. Beyond 12 hours, the enemies engage in advanced psychological tactics against the player, with methods that range wildly and tend to be specific to the player's mindset and play style. For example, one player likes to exert a high level of control over all four of their squad members, 
In response, enemies used attacks that did little or no damage, but caused the characters to become dazed, a state which temporarily disrupts player control. However, rather than attack the dazed characters, enemies simply surround them in a crowd, continually using daze attacks to prevent the player from doing anything. This caused major frustration for the player. Enemies may also attempt to induce psychological terror among the players. In one example, enemies somehow kidnapped one of the four player characters and dragged them off screen. When this character was later found, they were strapped to a kind of sacrificial altar. This caused considerable anxiety for the player. It seems that this is the upper limit of the game's anomalous powers in most cases, meaning things typically level off after 12 hours. Unless a specific entity appears to be inhabiting the game, which you'll learn more about later. In order to discover the prior information, the SCP Foundation performed a series of tests on the game with various different subjects. In Test 001, junior researcher Ross, an experienced gamer who was pivotal in first discovering the anomaly, skipped ahead of the typical preliminary D-Class tests. Seeing as he was already eager for the game's non-anomalous release, he was also eager to be the first in line to try it out on the Foundation's dime. Being a gamer, Ross also found a number of glitches and exploits in the game to improve his performance, allowing him to run rings around his enemies. However, as expected, the enemies adapted to Ross's techniques after gathering his player tactical data. First, they just began using their weapons and exploiting the environments more effectively, but they didn't stop there. Soon they became aware of the same exploits Ross was using, before exploiting them themselves and using it to beat him repeatedly. In the end, they moved to the psychological stage, forcing Ross into a glitch that rendered him unable to move. He tried to free his character for several minutes, until realizing he couldn't and rage quit the game. In Test 002, they used a D-Class designated D-22930. He was a man with proven anger issues, even down to murdering his prior girlfriend in a jealous rage. Initially, he enjoyed the game, choosing the thug character type and taking out his aggression on the many enemies. However, as time went on, the enemies became wise to his tactic and began their psychological attacks. They gathered around the D-Class's player character, dropping their weapons, but the swarm became so tightly packed around the character that he couldn't even move. This started to cause major frustration. When the character attempted to charge through, the enemies attacked, killing him with their bare hands. In Test 014, the Foundation brought in an agent with Special Forces experiences with advanced knowledge in tactical combat. However, even she was worn down and defeated over time as the enemies adapted to and exploited her tactics. The Foundation even considered using SCP-1633 as a tool for developing effective counter-tactics in their real-life operations. In Test 021, the Foundation used a D-Class with vast experience in the world of commercial gaming. He was told to complete the game in one playthrough, taking pauses rather than proper breaks. As predicted, with no time to run the background processes and create player tactical data files, the enemies weren't able to improve, and the D-Class was able to complete the game in around 13 hours. However, the game did create a player tactical data file in the aftermath of this playthrough, and used it to offer a new game plus mode to the D-Class. When he began to play this new game, the screen displayed a seemingly random pattern of black and white pixels, visually similar to television static. This image appeared to be cognitohazardous, as it caused catatonia and later death for the player, in what felt like a decidedly petty move for SCP-1633. As alluded to earlier, the game was first discovered by junior researcher Ross, who was an avid follower of the independent game studio initially producing the game. However, while frequenting developer fan forums, he found that various members of the team were quitting the project for seemingly bizarre reasons. While this wasn't enough on its own for the Foundation to intervene, it was what first attracted official attention. They moved in after the death of Gregor Tillman, a game tester for the company, who died not long after joining the project. The Foundation moved in and after that gained control, shutting down the studio and taking everything they had. All anomalous elements were isolated, secured, and contained. Any loose ends were given amnestics and recorded data on the anomalous artifacts were destroyed, 
It's believed that one classified female member of the dev team was behind the anomalous nature of the game, but she was able to escape and has since attempted to join other development teams. She is now considered an active person of interest and is being pursued by Mobile Task Force Mu6, aka Don't Hate the Player. Some final disturbing details are recorded in a note left by the game tester Gregor Tillman. The note seized by the Foundation and included in SCP-1633's official file reads as follows. I'm writing this on paper because I don't think he can learn it. He got everything digital real quick, but I've unplugged the router and broke my phone, so I think he's trapped in here. But he won't stop talking, talking, talking all the time. At the start of this job, they told me all about the tactical algorithm stuff, but man, I've been playing games all my life and I knew I could beat it. I, I knew I could handle this. When I started playing the game, they learned quickly. They kept using the sniper rifle and after like an hour, they learned how to use cover and then another couple hours and they'd set ambushes. Then another hour and they started sniping back while having a different squad flank me. After that, they figured out how to glitch the physics engine and ride crates at me or duck under the floor. They were learning, but all that was just easy stuff. It was evolution, man. When one bit figures something out so it survives longer than the others, it wasn't directed. After Act 3, Krathnar shows up. He's supposed to be like this Lovecraft, cosmic horror, crazy monster who can read the player's mind and corrupt your soul. He showed up right after I killed Strick the Blood Drinker, that big spider monster. He's supposed to have this long speech about how I killed his general on this plane and now he needs to intervene directly or something, but instead he talked about how I was a worthy adversary, but I was cheating because I was on another plane. Krathnar wasn't like the other enemies because he wasn't supposed to be. He was supposed to be smart, he was supposed to know everything, so he did. He'd been watching his minions fight me the whole time and he knew everything they did. It wasn't just random mutations anymore, it was planned. It wasn't evolution, man, it was actual intelligent design. I brought it home, I had to know more, I'm sorry, but I had to. I copied the latest compile and installed it on my home box and brought my save game and that other file with me on a flash drive. It was the same there. He kept talking to me about how I was keeping him from fulfilling his purpose by keeping him trapped in a glass jar. No matter where I went in the game, he kept shouting and ranting. Then he did more. At first, it was just slowing down in my other programs, the drive chugging when it shouldn't be. Then the next time I played the game, he started talking about my screenplays. All the enemies looked like me. I guess he could see through the webcam? He started needling me about Jenny, reading me bits of her emails, acting out the breakup. He found the videos of her and started making the enemies talk in her voice. Then he was everywhere in my computer. I uninstalled the game, but he was still there. He kept opening documents and typing to me, calling me a foul cheat and a lowly worm, telling me to fight him on the same plane. As soon as I realized he was outside the game, I shut down my router, pulled out the network card, but I don't know if I got them quickly enough. Maybe he got out. I turned the computer off, but he kept turning it back on. I wanted to break it, but I didn't know if that would kill him. Maybe it wouldn't, maybe it would let him out. I tried leaving the house, but it was like I could still hear him. I couldn't leave him alone because he might get out or do something else. I can't sleep. Haven't slept since he came out. I've been here for three days and I can't leave. I can't leave him. He keeps telling me to release him, but I can't. I want to kill him, but I don't know if I can. I, I can't think anymore. I have to kill, kill, kill him before he does anything new. He won't stop talking and he, I can't keep thinking. I can't keep going. I, I'm sorry. I have to go now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. After studying the note carefully, the Foundation conducted a thorough investigation for any other manifestations of this Krathnar entity. No mentions of it were found on any of the other devices in Tillman's apartment, nor did a web search on the subject turn up any relevant results. At this time, it is believed that the entity, whatever it was, or whatever it was attempting to do, was destroyed along with Tillman's computer, which he appeared to have taken apart, smashed, and burned in a metal trash can. Whatever tormented him during his last days on Earth is gone now. Thankfully, because the Foundation currently owns the only copy of the game, and the game's anomalous effects are only evident to active players, SCP-1633 poses no risk of containment breach, and therefore, it has been given the object class safe. One copy of SCP-1633 is stored on a standard DVD-ROM in a secure storage locker in Site-15, along with all supporting documentation and ancillary materials. Any playthroughs of the game must be approved by Project Head Dr. Berger, and all of said playthroughs are to be monitored closely and subject to strict rules. After all, this is one game that doesn't play fair. 
Now go check out SCP-5167 when the imposter is sus. God, I can't believe we did that episode. And the deadliest game, SCP-1918 Tic-Tac-Toe, for more of the world's deadliest games.